Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to the first webinar in Move Muscle Bone and Joint Health 2017 Musculoskeletal Health Webinar Series. A musculoskeletal health webinar series will be covering a range of issues including our webinar today on falls prevention and other webinars on issues such as the management of neck pain, low back pain, common foot problems, pain management in people with inflammatory forms of arthritis. Details regarding these webinars can be found on our website and will also be sent to you. Before introducing our presenters for today, I just have a couple of housekeeping issues to run through. Firstly, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the message box on your screen. You can type a message for the organiser at Redback Conferencing at any time. In today's webinar, our presenters won't be on camera, so don't be concerned that you won't be able to see them you should be able to hear them loud and clear. Also, Welsh-style presenters will generally answer questions at the end of their presentation. You can actually type questions for them at any time. Can I suggest you don't leave your questions to the last minute as we will aim to finish no later than 1.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Summer Time. I'd also be grateful to participants if you could take a moment at the end of the webinar to answer the questions in our exit survey. Our main presenter for today is Associate Professor Anna Barker from Monash University. Anna is the Head of the Health Services Research Unit at Monash and is an experienced falls prevention researcher and physiotherapist. She has developed a strong interest in the management of older people, having led falls projects in community, residential, aged care and hospital settings, including the world's largest falls prevention trial in the hospital setting, the six-pack trial, that included more than 60,000 patients. Anna will be assisted in the webinar today by Jason Tolevsky. Jason is a research assistant within the Health Services Research Unit at Monash also. His research background is in falls prevention and healthy ageing. Jason has worked with the falls and bone health team at Monash since 2012 and is currently working across multiple large-scale trials being undertaken by his team. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Anna and Jason. Thanks very much, Anna. Thanks, Jen. That was a, a warm welcome. So welcome, everybody, to today's webinar. And thank you for joining us at lunchtime. I hope uh, you're all uh, getting to enjoy some of that beautiful sunshine that's out there and uh, getting some vitamin D to, to help with things as well. Um, the first thing that we'd like to do, you've learnt a, a little bit about Jason and I, is to learn a little bit more about you guys. So we do have a poll, but um, we'd like to just get a bit more further information on you right now. So the first question we just want to learn a little bit about is your background in terms of physio, OT, GP, medical specialist, health promotion, fitness professional, nurse, exercise science and Sorry if I've missed anyone up there in terms of profession. So let's just have a look at what we've got. Looks like a bit of a, a pretty typical to most of the, the courses that we run and that's a very large uh, representation from the physios out there which is great to see. Um, obviously physios play a key role in terms of exercise prescription for preventing falls. Uh, but increasingly we're seeing this is cutting across uh, many different areas and Jason and I have run a number of seminars with Fitness Australia, Physical Activity Australia and other organisations where we're seeing that really it's, it's everyone who's getting involved with exercise for falls prevention. Okay, so in terms of what we're aiming to cover today, um, Sorry, just getting the slides through. There we go. So the learning objective, really what we've set out for today, is to gain an understanding in the skills and tools required to prescribe and deliver targeted and effective exercise to reduce the risk of falls in older people. So we're going to have a chat to begin with about the prevalence of falls and, and the problems that they have in terms of personal costs and financial costs. We're also going to have a little bit of revision I expect for most people uh, on the key modifiable risk factors for falls. And then the bulk of what we're going to talk about today is looking at uh, how to apply the best practice guideline recommendations that exist in terms of falls prevention. 
So we just had another poll that I, I wanted to get a bit more information on you from and that was a, a poll that was going to look at which setting that you work in. As we know falls is a, a problem across the care continuum. It doesn't matter if you work in hospitals or in the community or private practice. Uh, there are many areas so it's just uh, good for me to get a bit of a feel of, of where everyone's working. So it looks like we're neck and neck for private practice, community and hospital. So great to see that we've uh, got people from across the care continuum. A lot of the information that we present today uh, comes from research that's done in a community setting and there are little nuances in terms of the application to, to different setting and the evidence base is a little bit different. So just keep that in mind when presenting the information that largely it's, it's referring to evidence that relates to the community setting. So what we're going to cover, as I said, is that overview of the problem of falls in older people, a review of risk factors, and then looking at the best practice guideline recommendations and the evidence base that we have about exercise to prevent falls, and then how we can apply that in everyday practice. We're going to finish with a couple of case studies, which I think always helps to put, let the rubber hit the road, so to speak, in terms of looking at the learnings and how it might apply in a, in a practical setting. So I think we all know this. You almost don't need to put this slide in these types of presentations. It's, in, it's almost in every presentation that you go to in healthcare these days, and that is about our ageing population. And really the, the statistics are, are quite um, certain on the fact that we are really looking like we're moving towards one in four people um, being aged over 65 by the year 2051. And so it's a huge shift in terms of our population really being largely in the older age category. When we look at falls, it's really uh, not just a problem for older people. We do know that 8% of women in their 40s fall. I'm sorry men, we don't have the same statistics for men, but I'm sure that the results would be somewhat similar in terms of pattern and distribution across men. We know that 14% of women aged in their 50s fall at least once a year, 25% in their 60s and the number just keeps going up. So basically we see with increased age we have increased prevalence of falls. But I think a key thing to remember is that it is not just for older people that falls we really need to be thinking about. When we're moving into a stage of, of primary prevention we really need to be thinking at, at all age groups can benefit from balance exercises. We know unfortunately that falls are a considerable cause of harm in our population. So they constitute the largest proportion of hospitalised injury cases, uh, representing over 40% and followed by other unintentional injury cases and transport accidents. And to me that statistic is really uh, pertinent. When you see the, the incidence of falls compared to that of motor vehicle accidents, 40% versus 12, yet the amount of, of focus that we have on falls prevention out there in the community would be much smaller than we have on the than what we have on the prevention of road traffic accidents. We also know that in 2012-13 uh, there were over 170,000 people that were hospitalised because of a fall in Australia and that the majority of these were in people aged over 65. Unfortunately, falls is a common reason for death in people aged over 65 and unfortunately over 50% of those hospitalised after a fall will die within one year. So I guess that paints a, a picture of this falls related harm and falls in activity cascade. An older person may fall, the fall then results in a decrease in their balance confidence which then leads them to restrict and decrease their activity which unfortunately then leads on to functional decline and also then uh, further increases the risk of, of fall and, and fall injury and we end up with this cascade and repeating cycle of events.
When we look at the costs associated with falls, they, they are costly and it is very difficult to actually get accurate estimates on the cost of falls because the costs that incur as a result of a fall are, are not just borne by the emergency department or the hospital system. They are, are borne by visits to healthcare practitioners. They might result in new medications being taken or um, trips to the pharmacy for dressings and things to uh, cover uh, falls related injuries or skin injuries. But from the estimates that we do have, the national lifetime cost of a fall is known to exceed $1 billion per year in Australia. When we look at data from New South Wales, we see that there is an estimated cost of, of over $560 million just in New South Wales alone. And as you see, those estimates are almost 10 years old, so undoubtedly an underestimate that we have there. Um, in terms of the, the cost just to the acute hospital system, there's uh, uh, suggestions that that is around $650 million a year. And again, similar to what I did with the prevalence, you know, they're all really big numbers, so what do they really mean? And I guess when we look at, at the fall related costs and the estimates that we do have and how they compare to motor vehicle accidents, they are more than double the cost of motor vehicle accidents in terms of the management of falls injuries. So a substantial burden to our healthcare system and our society. So data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics in 2012 um, showed that just over half, so 53% of Australians aged 65 years and over had a disability. So that's about 1.7 million people. And this is compared to 16% of those aged 25 to 64. Now in this survey it also showed that among older Australians living in households, the most common long-term health condition was actually arthritis and this affected about 49% of those aged 65 years and over. So for, um, as most of you may know, osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis. It affects over 2.2 million people in Australia, which this is expected to increase to 3.1 million by 2030. Um, prior research has also shown that people with osteoarthritis are at a higher risk of falls and fall related injuries compared to those without osteoarthritis. Now a recent study that um, used data from the Osteoarthritis Initiative in the US, this was done in 2016, um, this study actually reported that people aged 45 to 79 years with hip or knee OA had over a 50% greater likelihood of experiencing a fall and they also had over an 80% greater chance of fracture. Now this kind of comes hand in hand with what Anna was speaking about before, that falls aren't just an issue in older people. Specifically in people with osteoarthritis, falls are affecting those aged 45 to, 60, to 65 as well, of those over 65. Um, despite this, our osteoarthritis clinical practice guidelines largely focus on pain management strengthening and aerobic exercises and weight loss. And no attention is given to screening and management of fall risk. In contrast, the Australian best practice guidelines for fall prevention actually identify arthritis as a risk factor for falls. This is because some of the symptoms and impairments associated with hip and knee osteoarthritis, such as pain, muscle weakness and impaired balance, are also well-known risk factors for falls. Now the strong association between hip and knee osteoarthritis and increased falls risk highlights the importance of incorporating fall prevention into routine osteoarthritis care. Now between 2000 and 2030, the older adult population, that is those aged 65 years and over, is projected to grow from about 35 million to over 70 million. The US Public Health Service actually estimates that 60% of deaths related to falls are preventable. So this begs the question, um, how do we go about reducing falls and fall related injuries among older adults? We believe that proactive falls prevention programs are needed to prevent injurious falls and help maintain or improve the quality of life of the fast growing older adult population. I'll now hand you back over to Anna, she'll be discussing the fall risk factors.
Thanks, Jace. That's great. And I think uh, it's really nice to, to get those statistics about the arthritis population and, and see, again, it's not just a problem in, in older age, it's something that we need to be considering at all age groups. So when we have a look at falls risk factors, there are a number of falls risk factors. This is a, a diagram from the World Health Organization that summarizes a, a number of risk factors. They include behavioral risk factors or biological intrinsic risk factors that exist with individuals. Increased age, as we saw from the prior slides, is a key risk factor. Chronic conditions, as Jason has alluded to with arthritis. We also know that the, the physical activity levels of older people um, uh, can have associations as well as their cognitive impairment and an effective or, or mood um, in terms of a falls risk factor. We also know that there are socioeconomic risk factors and environmental risk factors. We've probably all experienced the environmental risk factors out there. Hands up, no one can see, so don't feel that you're going to be shamed, but hands up if you've fallen over. If you've fallen on a slippery road or over in the snow, for me it was trying to conquer the, the black runs over at Nisico. So falls again, not just for older people. What we do know though is that a history of falls is the strongest predictor of future falls. So whilst there are a plethora of falls risk assessments that are out there, the number one question that you should be asking with your patients and clients is about a history of falls. That is the strongest predictor that they are at risk of future falls. That one question uh, can be just as powerful as a number of risk assessment tools. So with that, you can gain a lot of information about the circumstances of prior falls that might really provide an insight into how what risk factors might be present for an individual and therefore what might need to be addressed in a, in a program. So when we look at the modifiable risk factors that, that exist for falls, and we, we sort of break down between those that are modifiable and those that are not, I've yet to come across any really strong hard research evidence about how we can reverse age. So we are not able to modify some of the risk factors that exist out there for falls. So we need to focus on the ones that we can change. And so you see uh, that there are a number up there in, in terms of the amount of exercise an older person does, their muscle strength, the medications that they take, vision, fear of falling, balance impairment, and poor reaction time. And probably the risk factor with the highest level of evidence is balance impairment. There are numerous studies that have really shown the importance of, of balance impairment as a risk factor for falls. And therefore, balance is something that we really aim to target and improve with exercise that aims to decrease falls. So I'm going to hand back to Jason who's going to give us a little bit of a snapshot of what the current evidence base is regarding exercise for falls prevention. Yep. So before we go into that, we just have another poll for you. We just wanted to know if any of you were familiar with the falls prevention best practice guidelines for exercise to improve balance and reduce falls. Just a quick yes or no. Okay. A lot of no's. Yes, good. Well, that's good to see. And even those of you that are familiar with the guidelines, we hope that today's session will provide a, a little bit more of a practical how-to in terms of how to apply them. So uh, even those that are familiar with them, hopefully we can provide uh, you with some good tips and tricks in terms of how to interpret the recommendations and apply them. So of the previous research in falls prevention, we have up there at uh, Cochrane Systematic Review. This was completed by Gillespie and colleagues in 2012. In the review, it included 159 trials, which is quite a few trials for a systematic review. I mean, it shows that there is a lot of research being undertaken in falls prevention. And just the handy fact, a lot of these trials were actually completed in Australia, so it's kind of Good to see that Australia is, let's say, leading the research in force prevention at the moment. Um, all these trials compared a force prevention intervention against no intervention control group. 
and they were all done in community, community dwelling older people. And of the 159 trials, exercise was the most common intervention tested in 59 of those trials. So on the screen you can see the findings. Um, it shows that multiple component group exercise reduced the rate of falls by almost 30% and also reduced the risk of falling by about 15%. And this was from 12 trials and 22 trials. Um, Home-based exercise reduced the rate of falls by over 30% and risk of falls by over 20%. And overall, exercise intervention significantly, significantly reduced the risk of sustaining a fall-related fracture by almost 70%. Which is a huge effect, yep. so very, very powerful. And just a, a little bit of research how-to. So you, you see there's two different statistics that we're presenting there. We talk about reductions in the rate of falls. So that means that every fall that a participant in the research study had was counted, doesn't if they had one fall, that contributed to the data set. If they had 10 falls, that contributed to the data set. The second statistic that's presented is the risk of falling. So that is whether or not the person fell. Doesn't matter if it was one time, doesn't matter if it was 10 times during the follow-up period. In my opinion, the most uh, robust measure is the one that looks at the rate of fall because sometimes interventions don't prevent the first fall. They may prevent the second, the third, the fourth fall. And so I think that's where it's much more telling when you're looking at the research evidence to really look at that, that rate of falls and the impact on the rate of falls, not just the risk of falling. Yep. So we have here another systematic review that was published in 2012 that focused on all forms of exercise that were designed to prevent falls in older adults. The review included 54 trials and some exercise programs included in the studies were Tai Chi, Otago. And the, at the end of the review, it actually provided a list of best practice recommendations that could be used to guide future exercise programs for fall prevention. Um, there were eight recommendations, as you can see on the screen. And the authors recommended that to prevent falls, exercise programs should um, provide a moderate or high challenge to balance and exercise must be of a su sufficient dose to have an effect. So greater than two hours per week and greater than 50 hours over the total study period. And if, um, if studies did include these two recommendations, exercise, uh, yeah, exercise programs that included balance training and a higher dose of exercise actually achieved a 38% reduction in falls, which is actually what a massive reduction in fall. Um, I will now hand you back over to Anna, who will be talking about how to use best practice guideline recommendations in practice. So uh, a caveat here that some of the information now presented in the subsequent slides is an Anna Barker interpretation of the recommendations. So this, uh, some of this detail is not specific to the recommendations in terms of the, the how-to of, of applying it. So the first recommendation that the guidelines had, which Jason uh, mentioned, was that exercise must provide a moderate to high level challenge of balance. So what does that mean? How do you provide balance exercises that are challenging? So quite simply, the way that you, you challenge balance is by reducing the base of support. So you can see in the first photo down the bottom there, the person is doing a lunge and it's in a, a narrow base of support because the, the feet are um, very, uh, uh, almost as if you're on a tightrope while, while doing the exercise. The second picture that we have there is the person standing on one leg while performing a, a stepping over exercise. So again, reducing the base of support to just be standing on, on one leg. The other ways that we need to think about when we are providing a, a challenge to balance is what I call providing multi-sensory conditions. So we know that there are lots of systems that contribute to balance. We receive information from proprioceptors, the vestibular system, that information is then, and from the visual system, it is then integrated in the, the uh, central um, uh, central nervous system and then we have motor outputs that then are response to that balance information that has been um, inputted. 
So we need to think about training balance in a multi-sensory way. We need to challenge the visual system, we need to challenge the proprioceptors, challenge the vestibular system, and also challenge that central integration. So some examples of the way that we might do this is via head turns, with eyes closed, unstable surfaces and visual stimulation. So you can see in the picture there, that's me working with a client in, in a clinical Pilates setting. They are receiving a, a moderate to high level challenge to balance because they are throwing the ball whilst performing an exercise of standing ab and adduction, which is on an unstable surface, the platform moves. There is stimulation to the visual field by the ball moving up and down in the visual field. And um, as I said, the, um, the platform is moving so on unstable surface. So in terms of uh, the other recommendation that is an Anabarca recommendation with regarding to uh, providing a balanced challenge, it really we have to think that most of our exercises need to be performed in a standing position. And again, this is an Anabarca percentage, but my recommendation is that at least 75% of the exercises that are provided need to be performed in a standing position if the aim of the exercise class is to improve or challenge balance. So in terms of um, other ways that you can challenge balance. This is one of my favourite ones that I think often gets forgotten. So on the earlier slide I mentioned that there is central integration of the balance information and dual tasking is a great way to provide an additional balance challenge. Inevitably many of your patients and clients might report to you that the reason that they fell over is they were thinking about something else, they were distracted uh, trying to look for a, a street sign whilst walking along the street Perhaps they were rushing to the telephone or thinking about the shopping list while they were um, racing around trying to get out of the house. And that impact then demonstrates how dual tasking can compromise um, an, an older person's balance. So if there is uh, an opportunity to then integrate dual tasking into exercises, it's a great way to retrain the brain's ability to be able to multitask. So ways that you can do this is that people might be doing their, their standard exercises. For example, like this one here in the picture where they're throwing the ball up and down on an unstable moving, surf, moving surface and then that's seeming a bit easy. So at the same time you say to the patient, okay, I'd like you to count backwards from 20 in threes whilst doing this. You might get them to rub your tummy and pat your head. So some sort of coordination task that gets them focusing on, on what they're doing with their hands but they've still got to maintain balance at the same time. Throwing a ball obviously and uh, balancing a ball on a cup, you can get as creative as you like but really thinking about adding in a task that means that they're concentrating on doing something else whilst trying to maintain their balance in a challenging position. Other ideas, another favourite, probably I'm going to put these all as my favourite, but that is to really focus on training postural and step reactions. So with this, we all trip and stumble, but not all of us fall over. And a reason that not all of us fall over is because we have effective step strategies or postural reactions to stop us from our centre of gravity, from all falling outside of our centre, our centre of mass falling outside of our centre of gravity, sorry. So with this you can do very simple stepping tasks that demand speed and weight shift and practice then being able to respond quickly to a perturbation or becoming off balance and regaining balance by taking a step. So you see some examples here from the work that I used to do up at the Neurological Aging and Balance Clinic at the University of Queensland where we have people throwing Swiss balls to each other and with the, the throwing of the, the Swiss ball inevitably the recipient has to take a step to catch the ball or move and adjust their posture in a response to then catching the ball. And this is a great way to look at, at training step reactions and postural reactions. 
Another example here, say you don't have a group and it's a one-on-one. -on -one. Someone can do it uh, on their own by bouncing a ball against the wall. You see that we've got the mats underneath to create a slightly unstable surface that then uh, again creates a balanced challenge. The next bit, again, this is an Anabarka interpretation. And provide a balanced challenge by creating a situation of controlled instability. So the balance exercises need to be difficult to ensure that they actually try and improve balance. So with this, you really want to make sure that your exercises are performed without hand support, either from the assistant or the person delivering the exercise, or that they're not holding onto the assistant or the person delivering the exercise, or that they're not holding onto a rail while doing their exercises. As soon as someone hangs on to something to perform balance exercises, it changes the way that the postural muscles work and the balance systems work. And it is not the same then as the way that people would be performing tasks out there in everyday life. So you want the task to as closely match the situations where people may be at risk of falling over. So what I do with my clients is I get them to rate how difficult they find the exercise in terms of their balance. And I really want people to be working at at least a 7 out of 10 difficulty. So they, can, they find the exercise somewhat difficult. So 0 out of 10 is not difficult at all. 10 out of 10 is, oh my god, this is so difficult, I can't do it. In saying that, you don't want it so difficult that they can't perform the, the exercise to enough uh, repetitions that enables them to train balance. So the magic number that I work towards is seven. So I try and make exercises seven out of 10 difficult and that they can perform at least seven reps of the exercise. If they can perform easily a lot more than seven reps, then maybe that's an indication that the exercise needs to be made a bit more difficult. If they can't achieve seven reps, then maybe that's an indication that the exercise is too difficult and needs some modification to make it a little bit easier. So the next thing relates to the point that Jason presented about dose. So exercise must be of a sufficient dose to have an effect. So with this, we know that the bigger effects are seen with programs that involve a higher dosage of exercise. And typically this looks like two hours of exercise uh, a week. And when we talk about exercise, we are meaning specific balance exercises. And the way that this can most easily be achieved is through a combination of group-based and home-based exercises. So if you run a falls exercise class that only runs once a week and it only runs for an hour, well, then you need to make sure that participants have a home exercise program that they can work with that equates to another hour of exercise that they are doing in addition to their balance class to really make sure that effects are optimised. The other thing is an interesting one because it probably is at loggerheads with most of our, our programs that are funded out there, be it through private insurers or under enhanced primary care packages or in community rehab centres and, and the like. Typically people are only funded to attend a falls prevention program for a set duration of time. But surprise, surprise, as soon as people stop doing falls prevention exercise, the benefits in terms of improved balance are unfortunately quickly lost. So ongoing exercise is necessary. What we know is that only 37% of people in research studies are still exercising three or more times a week after they have completed their uh, set scheduled exercise that was part of the research study. So how do we achieve long-term behaviour change and motivate people to really continue to participate in force prevention exercise? Ways in which we can do that is really focusing on a lot of learnings that we have from our chronic disease literature. So thinking about self-management and self-management skills, thinking about motivational interviewing, 
and thinking uh, about making sure that we are working with our clients and patients in terms of ways that they can integrate fall prevention exercise in their routine, everyday activities. So does that mean that they're doing back balance exercises while they brush their teeth? Does it mean that they are doing uh, balance exercises uh, when they take the, the dog to uh, the park for a walk? But what are the ways that you can work with the individual to identify ways that they can integrate balance exercises into their everyday life from an ongoing um, perspective? The ways that you can make that as uh, aligned to the personal interests of the individual as possible, we know that that has a greater likelihood of success. The other thing that we know is if you can frame it in a positive way, rather than a negative or at-risk way, that's also likely to promote ongoing engagement. So in terms of that, that means that um, you really are working with the older individual to find out what they enjoy doing. Is it dancing? Is it going to the gym? Is it lawn bowls? And how can they then integrate balance exercises into that? We've just had a really good question pop up that said, says, so is around 20 minutes a day good? Yes, it is, but actually any combination that equates to two hours works. There isn't a strong evidence base that suggests that 20 minutes a day is better than one two-hour session or that two one-hour sessions is better than 20 minutes a day. But in practice, I find the little and often principle is usually a good one that really promotes um, uh, ongoing participation with the exercise. The other thing that's important to note is that really false prevention and balance exercises should be targeted at the general community as well as those that are at risk of falls. So it's never too early to start and really there are not a lot of harms in terms of performing balance exercises and so there are benefits really outweigh the risk. So what we know from the evidence base is that there are actually larger relative effects seen with programs that are offered to the general community compared to those that are just at risk. Those that are at risk still benefit from the exercises, but the biggest bang for our buck that we get is actually when we target the broader general community. And different groups of people will require different types of exercise. So high risk patients might require more uh, smaller groups and closer supervision than uh, the broader community does. The other bit of the evidence that we have, or should I say absence thereof, is that it doesn't seem that any one type of exercise is particularly more effective than another. So, Again, we can move back to personal preference. Some people might really enjoy working in a group and love the social aspect of that, whereas others might be happier to work at home with an exercise um, paper-based sheet that they've got uh, to work through, an exercise DVD on their own, um, or even some online resources that they might be accessing. So it's really important to consider patient preference. But what I would say for those that are attending group sessions, really consider augmenting those with a home-based program so that you do work towards achieving that two hours per week. Now, I'm not sure about you guys, but one common thing that I hear from my patients is they say to me, I do a lot of exercise already. I walk the dog every day. I walk to the shops. I'm walking around all the time, so I, I think I, I really don't need any more exercise. But what we know is that walking doesn't equate to balanced training. And indeed what we see is when walking is included in a balanced exercise program and counted as part of the two hours a week dosage, we actually see that it waters down the effect. So we know that walking is really good for people and we don't want to discourage people from being physically active and getting their 10,000 steps a day. But what we need to consider is that walking is in addition to balanced exercise and it doesn't equal balanced exercise. 
So you'll see um, from down here, um, I'll just get the pointer up. You see that um, when a walking program is included, the reduction in falls is only 10% compared to when programs focus on providing a moderate to high level challenge to balance and, and don't have walking programs included in them. So that's just some of the numbers that relate to how including walking in a program does water down the effects. The other thing to note is that brisk walking is not for everybody. So there is indeed one study that showed that when people were encouraged to do brisk walking programs, that it actually increased the falls risk. So this is only one study. It was a small study, so you need to take the information with a grain of salt, but just have it in your mind of when you're prescribing exercise to older people, that maybe some people may be at risk of falls if you are encouraging them to do brisk walking. So there's a similar picture with strength training. So again, it can be included in the overall exercise program for older people, but it shouldn't substitute the balance exercises. So it's in addition, not in place of. So including strength training does not seem to be a crucial component of falls prevention exercise programs. In saying that, there's an absence of, of longer term data. So maybe the results show up later on down the line and after the research studies have finished. We know, similar to walking, that strength training has many other benefits. It's, it has a great effect in, in terms of uh, prevention of frailty um, and sarcopenia, and also that it can have um, positive uh, effects on, on bone and, and those sorts of things. So, Strength training, again, is a good thing, but the message is that it should be in addition to your balance exercises and not part of your two hours. So activation and strengthening of key proximal and postural muscles is really important. So when I deliver exercise programs that are targeting falls prevention, I have a big focus on the uh, dorsi and, and plantar flexors at the ankle in preparation and, and trying to work on ankle strategies. I also um, have a big focus on activating the core muscles in terms of transversus abdominis and multifidus, and also the hip muscles that are important for step strategies and may also then have a positive effect on bone density around the hip. So the other thing to consider is that falls is multifactorial and when you remember those slides that I put up at the start about risk factors for falls and balance impairment, whilst being a very important risk factor, is not the only risk factor that exists for many people. Therefore, it's really important that you consider engaging the GP and talking to them about the older person's falls risk and referral to falls and balance clinics. When people have complex falls problems, they may have medication, be taking multiple medications that might be impacting on their falls risk. They might have vestibular problems or dizziness that mean that there is a need for a referral to a vestibular physiotherapist. Cataract surgery as well. We know the vision impairment is a risk factor for falls and there is some very good evidence to support first eye cataract surgery in terms of its impact on reducing falls. There's also good uh, evidence around home safety advice and modifications. Reducing psychoactive medications and pacemakers are, are other effective interventions that you just need to be aware of and consider that referrals uh, for these may need to be made based on individual patient risk profile. The other bit of information about glasses is that uh, we know that the use of single lens rather than multifactorial glasses can have a positive effect on reducing falls in people who participate in regular outdoor activities. So I think one thing that is important to consider, in the earlier slides I said that balance exercises need to be difficult to improve balance, but 
But as soon as you make exercises difficult, there is a risk that people can fall over while performing them. So safety needs to be front and foremost in your mind when you're providing balance exercises to people. So you really need to make sure that the setup matches the participant's ability. So I really uh, like working in corners because they provide a, a safe environment where there is a wall on either side that the person can then steady themselves on if they overbalance. You need to uh, make sure that you are considering other clinical uh, impairments that a person may have. They might have knee pain. That means a modification to the exercise is required so that we don't exacerbate knee pain. We also um, need to make sure that standby supervision is provided when it's necessary and that is based on, on clinical judgment in terms of that. I think another key safety consideration is to always provide an appropriate explanation and uh, one thing that I always say to um, a patient when explaining it is I'm just going to show you what this exercise looks like. I don't want you to have a try of it until I've finished and I say go because we have many enthusiastic people out there that as soon as you start trying to demonstrate the exercise, off they go and jump in and try and do it as well and, and you might not be ready and, and prepared for that and, and so they may fall over. So instructions are, are really important. So what have you learnt? Key ingredients of effective balance exercises. I'd love you to put in some comments of some key take-homes that you've gotten from this. What are some key things that you went, ah, that was a new bit of information or that was interesting? What is the take-home that you're going to have in, in terms of, of this lecture? What's some new information that's come across or perhaps an interpretation of the guidelines that has, has been useful and beneficial? My key take homes for you that Jason and I have, have put together is that really it's important to engage the patient in exercise decision making and making sure that you do tailor programs to individual preferences to really enhance the ongoing participation in exercise. That challenging balance is really important. So that 7 out of 10 difficulty making sure that 75% of the exercises are in standing and making sure that exercises are performed without hands-on support. The other key take home is that two hour per week dosage and that really that two hours excludes strength training unless it's a strength exercise that has a challenging balance component. As you can see that exercise that I put up earlier where the, the the man was doing a lunge, that was a nice narrow space of support that provided a, a balance challenge and it's also a strength exercise, so tick. That, that would be able to be counted in your um, two hours of, of dosage. And the other thing is this ongoing need for it. So when people finish a full exercise program and you give them a high five and you say, great work, you've made some fantastic achievements, make sure you're having a conversation with them about how to keep it going. The other thing is about safety, so really thinking about your instruction, safe setup and position. That's um, really, really important to consider. So there's lots of, of nice tips that are coming through um, that I can see. Um, so in, in terms of this, so some, some key learnings that we've had is that balance exercises need to be challenging. That's great not holding on to supports during exercise, fantastic. We need to increase the volume of our falls prevention exercise. That's right, the two hours of dosage is, is really important. And that strength is a good thing, but that it is not something that you necessarily want to count in your two hours unless it's providing a, a, a balanced challenge. Louise has picked up that 75% is in standing, fantastic. And uh, we've got a, a question, are there any finding options apart from EPC referrals? So um, funding options, so private insurers, private insurers, many people, older people have private health insurance and they can access physios out there in private practice for that. Private insurers also support gym programs, so there, there are some funding options. Um, interestingly, um, with some colleagues, uh, Rochelle Bookbinder, um, Stephen Lord, 
Terry Haynes and myself, we have just led a, a case for action to the NHMRC that was prioritised that requested that we have Medicare item numbers for falls prevention exercise and the NHMRC has supported that and put that endorsement and recommendation through to the federal government. So hopefully um, what we can see is that in the future there will be more funding available under Medicare. There is a question about outcome measures. Um, that probably is beyond the scope of what we can cover in today's lecture. Um, but if you do want to know more, Jason, myself and the other team of physios here at Monash, we run a lot of professional development courses where we have one day workshops on this where we go through different um, outcome assessments and, and measures. We also um, provide a lot of hands-on practical application of brainstorming exercises, modifications, a lot more on the behaviour change aspect. So I think in terms of that, um, we can definitely forward you on the details of, of where our courses are listed and if you want to find out more information, you can uh, find out about that. So we just wanted to work through a couple of case studies now. We haven't got too much time left. So Jason's just going to give us a little bit of a, a summary about Judy. Yep. So just quickly, um, Judy is a healthy 71-year-old who walks for about one hour most days around her local park. She's recently lost a little confidence after she fell over, showing a friend around in the city. Um, she actually tripped on the gutter. Judy reports that she has never had a fall prior to this event and has come to you for some exercises to address her balance. She is otherwise healthy, taking no medications other than vitamin D. She does wear multifocal glasses and does not use a gate aid. So um, on the screen you can see we have two headings under Judy's picture. There's falls risk factors and exercise prescription. So just want to quickly ask you if you can write down in the comment section just from a, um, Judy's background, what do you think her fall risk factors are and just few ideas about what exercise you would prescribe for Judy. Probably give you a couple, about 30 seconds. Sounds good. This was, this was a real live patient, so it's yeah. a real live case study. Um, so I, I think there's um, lots of, of typical things in there. So it would be great to, to see what risk factors you can come up with and um, what ideas you, you have. So it looks like we've got some great activity here. People are on the money in terms of picking up the risk factors. Yep, very good. So this is great. So um, let's have a look what we came up with. So we saw that age was a risk factor definitely. Previous fall was a risk factor. Did anyone pick up previous fall? as a? Yes, we did. We had someone raise that up. Vision impairment and the multifocals was definitely. I see that other people have put in there the, the multitasking. Um, so she was uh, probably chatting away to her friend when the fall happened. So in terms of ideas for, for exercise, um, definitely some things that we worked on with Judy was looking at toe clearance. So that, that sort of just looking at her gait and stepping ability and um, making sure um, that we practiced a, a lot of uh, stepping so that she wasn't at risk of, of tripping over again. Single leg stance because obviously she fell when she was stepping up and, and standing on one leg. Stepping over obstacles um, would be fantastic. Foot and ankle exercises that then really work on, on getting those postural reactions going would be fantastic for Judy as well. Multitasking and definitely a referral to the optometrist to, to have a look at um, the, the glasses prescription. We provide a lot of education around multifocals and, and about how they can distort the field of vision when you look down in the lower half of them to obstacles that are in the ground. So to be aware of that and either take the glasses off to look down um, or even consider using other single lens outside. In terms of our next case study, Beth, tell us yes. about Beth, Jason. Meet Beth. She's 59 years old and has been referred to your clinic from a GP with mid-vestibular dysfunction affecting her balance. Beth tells you that she often gets dizzy when she turns her head. She has cataracts. She does not think she is at risk of falling. And on further questioning, you find out that Beth has had a few stumbles in the, pad in the paddock chasing sheep. So based on Beth's background again, um, just have a go at listing a few of the four risk factors and what kind of exercise you prescribe. 
And it's interesting, Beth didn't think her falls were a problem. She said everyone falls over in the paddock chasing sheep. Yep. And not everyone does. So that was, um, there was a, it was interesting in terms of that, that Beth just considered her profile very normal. She said, oh, everyone falls over. You know, it's muddy, it's slippery, you know, the sheep are moving around. So I'm in mean, gum boots. So all of these things, she thought it was very normal. But um, we definitely, uh, after working with Beth, were get her, able to get her to a stage where she didn't totally stop falling over, but definitely had a significant reduction in the number of falls that she had in the paddock chasing sheep. So let's see what risk factors people have come up with with Beth. And again, yes, the previous fall. What risk factors people have come up with with Beth. And again, yes, the previous fall. Um, we have got the vision impairment that's related to the to the cataracts and the balance impairment. We also have the vestibular issue um, in terms of that, um, and um, that that's really important. So in terms of the exercise prescription, we really focused on exercises that challenge the vestibular system. So we did that by doing a lot of exercises in a narrow base of support incorporating head turns and eyes closed. Um, we also did a lot of work on unstable surfaces to try and replicate the muddy paddocks. So we had lots and lots of those foam mats stacked on top of each other. We did um, exercises with uh, shoes on and with shoes off to uh, create different balance challenges. We did a lot of dual tasking because, of course, Beth was focusing on the sheep and where they were running away to rather than, oh my gosh, am I steady on my feet? Um, so that was a, a key thing that we did with Beth and we included a lot of visual challenges as well that sort of linked to the vestibular system and also that busy environment in the paddock with the sheep of lots of things moving in front of a visual field. So we did a lot of the sort of the ball throwing up and, and down in, in front of the face. We also um, referred um, uh, Beth to see a vestibular physiotherapist. So we actually might slip through the last case study. It will be available on the notes and you can read through about Ken and, and learn about him and get some, some other ideas. But we just wanted to, to wrap up now. We've got a, a little video that we, we wanted to show you. So we're, we'll um, cue the, the video up and by all means put through the, some more questions that we've, we've got there in, in terms of the, the comments box. And um, hopefully we can um, get um, the video up and running very soon. And um, here we go. I'm not sure if you can all hear me now. I was just going to get the video um, footage that would be muted. Um, so basically this is, a, I think, a great video that shows it's a flash mob that was done by uh, Profound, which is a great organisation that you can have a Google about. They've got lots of falls prevention resources. And it was done across the world and, and all these different people uh, giving a, an example of the falls prevention exercises that they were doing. And it's a great little video and we'll include the YouTube link um, in terms of the, the notes so that you can have a look at it yourself. And it's a real fun one to, to have a look at. 
There's been um, some some great uh, feedback in in terms of the participants, in terms of uh, you've been great at identifying the the risk factors that you've seen and and coming up with some good ideas in terms of interventions and and exercise programs. Um, Jason and I have really enjoyed delivering today's session. It's been different for us to to sit here without seeing you. Normally we do this in in the lecture here, theatre here at Monash, and there's plenty of interaction along the way. Um, so I, I hope that um, we've been able to achieve a modified version of that via the webinar. Um, but what we'd really like to do is, is to, to say um, stay tuned for uh, some more information on some of the courses that we run here and if you're interested then in, in learning more and, and in terms of the falls prevention space you can register for some of our courses. So over and out and back to you Jen. Good on you, Anna. Thanks so much uh, to you and Jason. It was really such a fantastic, comprehensive and interesting presentation. We're right on 1.30, so we will finish up. I would like to ask people to take a moment to uh, answer the exit, to respond to the exit survey, which will come onto your screens after we close down. Thanks so much for joining the webinar today. And many thanks again, Anna and Jason. And good afternoon to everyone. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks for joining us today. Go get some vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.